And hello, how is everybody today? Now, if this isn't an episode dedicated to creating and destroying, I don't know what is. I just finished up with an amazing conversation with the one and the only Carl Hughes Hodges. Uh, Carl came over to to my place and we had a coffee and an epic chat. We spoke about all things making it in the creative fields as well as travel and inspiration. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Carl's work, Carl Hughes Hodges is an Australian artist. His work focuses on colour, spatial balance and movement, and it's contrasted by complex narratives that combine the ideas of nature, the built environment, human behaviour and abstraction. Carl's been working full-time as a self-employed visual artist for the past 14 years, and he's exhibited in nearly every continent. He's had solo exhibitions in Perth, Melbourne, Berlin, Amsterdam, Madrid, LA, Vienna, and his work is is collected by both private and public collections worldwide. On top of his fine art career, he also has a whole bunch of large-scale murals all over the place, and that's how Kyle and I first met, actually. He painted a mural on the Darkroom concept that I first saw back in 2013 for the, the first ever Rediscover. And so you can find Kyle's work from one story pieces like when we met all the way through to 12 story and above buildings. These murals are everywhere from New York City, Washington DC, LA, London, Sheffield, Singapore, Madrid, Berlin, Cambodia, Iceland, and heaps too many to mention across Australia. Now this conversation was super fun, super interesting. I actually learned a whole bunch more about Kyle that I never even knew. Um, and so it was just amazing. So without any more, uh, going on, I think it's best to jump straight into the conversation with Kyle. Um, in the show notes, you'll find a whole bunch of links to Kyle's work and a whole, uh, a lot of things that we spoke about actually throughout the conversation, you'll be able to find those in the notes. And as always, this podcast is brought to you by Rochambeau Studios. If you want to know more about what we do and what the heck the Rochambeau is, just head to rochambeau.co or reach out to me and more than happy to have a chat. So, as always, I'm Jordan Jan. This is Create and Destroy. Enjoy. Um, no, now we're recording. Cool. Sweet. How are you, dude? I'm good. Mate, How are you? Epic. I'm doing great. It's a warm, warm day here in Melbourne. About to hit 38 or 40 degrees. Yeah, it's that Western Australian weather. Mate, brought, it, brought it with me. Brought it with you in the suitcase. <laughs> Man, I'm glad that the aircon's cranking in here, though. We're just hanging out, having a coffee and um, reminiscing, really, talking about mm. projects and early dad days for you and a whole bunch of stuff. Yep. What brings you to Melbourne? Uh, I've got some two paintings in a group show at Backwards Gallery in yep. Collingwood. Um, and I try and come over every four to six months. Your folks are here, right? My folks are here. Yeah. Um, they've been here for nearly 10 years. Yeah. Um, and my brother, li- he lives in Mexico now, but he was here for like 15 years. So, yeah. but, um, apart from the family aspect, I try and come over for just catch up with friends and go to studio visits and see yeah. shows, exhibitions, things I want to see. Yeah. And, um, just get that little energy hit. You said, um, well, I watched an epic, epic short film you've got on your website. It's on Vimeo, Ordered Chaos. Is it full name, Ordered Chaos? No. Um, a Quiet Revolution, Ordered Chaos. Ordered Chaos. Yeah. And um, everyone should listen to that. I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put a link up for sure. I'm so glad I remembered what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Fuck, Google it. <laughs> um, but, the, yeah, you've got this amazing, amazing short film, which is the past 15 years of traveling around and um, painting and exploring how much, and I know that you touch it, touch on it in, in the video, but how much energy do you get from the, the studio visits and, you know, going to NGV and does that, can you feel it impact your work when you go back? Um, sometimes, uh, it's not always like a, um, in the moment thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's, um, uh, I guess I don't try and directly, um, be influenced stylistically by things I see or experience, but. It's just because I'm curious. I want to yeah. see more things and see new things. Mm. I want to catch up with artist friends and other creatives that aren't painting yeah. to be inspired by their projects and 
just those conversations. It's just um, energizing to be around like-minded people. Yeah. Um, and also people in different fields where you can kind of um, see into their wavelength. Yeah. You know, just having a coffee or going to the studio or they totally. might be working on projects that I would never work on, like lighting design or something. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'd never work on, that I'm currently not working on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's really inspiring to be like, oh, okay, this is how you problem solve and this is how you got to those endpoints. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's really important to um, engage and keep learning. But yeah. it's, it's a natural curiosity because I'm interested in it. Yeah. So I'm not uh, – I am being deliberate about it, but it's because I want to. So it's yeah. not like I'm forcing myself to be like, oh, I have to go yeah. hang out with all these uh, – people in Melbourne or Sydney or wherever. So fucking have beers with their mates. This yeah. sucks. Yeah. No, no. But um <laughs> and it's not all painters. Like I I I am I do try and um see lots of different things. So. Totally, totally. Yeah. I um I don't know if it's the same with you, but I, I often feel if I'm it's not a, a lack of creativity. Um more so it's it might be a a um reduction of inspiration. And so I'll find that if I'm I'm not exposing myself to to new things and new mediums or, and it might be anything from fucking tech or going down to the NGV or, you know, trying a new coffee shop, even, you know, you, you see something on broadsheet or, you know, any of those kind of trendy websites and you go, fuck that, that fit out's epic. Hmm. I'm going to go grab my latte there and I'll walk in and, and force myself to, to enter a new environment, which will then like refill my inspiration, I guess, like fuel take. Yeah. And then yeah. It, when that gets depleted, sometimes I, I feel, I don't know if it's the same for you, but it's when it's depleted, I then go, huh, hang on. I haven't actually had a good conversation with someone in so long, apart from the small talk or about a project. It's, it's often those conversations and connecting with people and talking deep rather than shallow. And yeah. that's the inspiration yep. refill, yep. if you will. And maybe it's a combination as well. Like it's, there's a lot of, that's what I meant by the longer vision of it. Like mm. there's things that you might take in or uh, small photographs you might take of textures or yeah, some flyer or something that you pick up Yeah, and it doesn't really resonate immediately, but maybe something you're working on in two years or you're starting to think about some colorway or something and then you just have this like, oh, I remember going down this laneway and even if that thing like going into this really nice new fit out, your memory of that fit out might be wrong, yeah. but it's sparking this thread. Totally. Um, and often, and I think there's a lot of studies about the brain that um, my colleagues would be able to quote better than me, but often your memories are incorrect. Yeah. Like, it's yeah, I, I remember hearing something about um, like if like someone robs a 7 Eleven or whatever, yeah. and uh, everyone's description of the robber is like always wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because you, yeah, well, they, well, not they always, were, but yeah. yeah, most of the time. Yeah, it's something about your, your brain. Every time you relive a memory, it actually manufactures new facts in it and to a point where you start believing that. And so sometimes when we remember, oh, I remember that time we caught up and it was that, it was that amazing. Yeah. Often it, it wasn't. It was just because you relived it in your brain so many times that you made it better and better and better because you really want it to be better. Yeah, that's a good pub story, Which is right? Epic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't let the <laughs> truth get in the in the way, right? So I, I just maybe want to bring it back because a lot of the the listeners to to this podcast, especially, it's really funny when I kind of see messages of people coming in. It's very, very broad from you know, mutual friends of ours that are definitely in the creative field, but there's also up and coming young entrepreneurs and as well as, you know, executives in big companies that are often not exposed to creatives or the process. Mm-hmm. Maybe if we rewind a little bit, you've been a visual artist for 15 years. Four, yeah. Like um, as a, I've been working for 15 years, but yeah. um, working on my personal artwork yeah. for the last, uh, what year is it? Oh, for the last 12 years. Yeah. But the first three I was doing street um, street work, but I was also working for commercial design studios. Yeah. So, Well, so I must, um, this is kind of going down, you know, memory lane for me as well, so maybe it's incorrect. But I remember when I, I moved to Perth, this was 2008, I want to say. Yep. I might be wrong, but around that time. I remember cruising. I lived in Mount Lawley, just up there near uh, ECU, Mount Lawley. Yep. And I remember seeing creepy kind of everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was a long time around where I never I never knew you at that point. And we met and we actually just looked at a photo that I 
had mm. a photo of you painting a mural on the very first shop of mine, Darkroom, back in, I think it was 2013 at the first Rediscover. Yeah. But I knew you as Kyle Hughes Hodges then, not yeah. as Creepy. Yeah. When did that inflection happen? Um, like and when was did it I, natural? Did you go, okay. When did sh- I switch up? Yeah. Um, yeah. It wasn't, uh, it was natural. Yeah. But <laughs> it was just so funny to me because at the, when I first started putting stuff out on the street, <clears throat> uh, it was kind of like early 2000s. Yeah. And no one, there wasn't like, it's not like it is now where street art's like a term, like a coffee table term. Yeah. And your grandma knows what it is. Yeah. Like no one really knew what it was except all the graffiti guys hated it. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't like people would be, what are you making? And I mm. didn't have, an, I'd just be like, I'm just make putting these posters up, like yeah. hand drawn one off posters. Man. And, um, you know, it, it was really exciting and energizing, but I, I wasn't like, um, it was just for me yeah. at that point. I'd had no idea how to have an exhibition. I had mm-hmm. no idea how to do a formal project. Yeah. And, uh, I guess I, I saw it as an opportunity to take control of this thing that I was obsessed with. I was obsessed with drawing, mm. but I didn't know how to show people and mm. galleries and things at that time to me seemed so unattainable. So well, I just started putting stuff outside because I was like, well, I'm sick of showing my mum <laughs> <laughs> and my friends and I've got drawers and drawers of pictures. I'm obsessed with drawing, always have been. Yeah. And it just instantly gave me this outlet. So um, it was amazing. I got to start seeing second layers, third layers of cities. These, 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 Something that's happened there, but sorry, you you were saying that you were seeing second and third layers of cities. Yeah. And, uh, at the time I was, um, uh, there was other people putting work up in Perth that I had recognized. Um, so Yock was a, Oh, um, yeah. A, you know, big influence back then and uh, Stormy Mills. Um, the one and only. The one and only. And uh, I just, it was just this outlet. It was like I didn't have to validate myself to anyone. Yeah. I, I didn't have to um, kind of feel like, oh, they've accepted it, so it must be a thing. And it's like, well, I've got this drive to do it, so just do it. Um, and that drive then, obviously before, you know, double taps and likes and, and all the things that kind of drive a lot of the street, well, a lot of the art culture really these days, yep. that recognition back then, there wasn't recognition from, oh, oh, my God, here's a photo and let's chuck it up and hope people like it. Was the driver, to me, it sounds like it was purely personal. It was very personal and it was just exciting because I would see other work, like I'd come to Melbourne or Sydney and see other people mm. doing these strange things with – um aliases like very hard to contact these people yeah i was actually um talking to uh david booth uh, yeah. ghost patrol before ghost patrol. and <laughs> it's it like before um any social media so i i would fly around the world um when i could and put up these posters and then i'd come back and put them on my website these tiny little images that you couldn't enlarge yeah and i had no analytics i, had no, I was like i guess someone will look at it yeah <laughs> Um, huh. so no, how, how would you say so you, you, were you meeting up with crew? Like you mentioned York and Stormy and, and Ghost Patrol. Were you meeting up with them then and just connecting? How, how would you connect then? Uh, <laughs> in old school meet people in real life, IRL. <laughs> I think there was like forums were a bit, uh, okay, yeah. I don't know if forums are still big, but, um, I was a bit more active in, in those kind of things. Yeah. Um, Google still worked. So like yeah, yeah. with, um, Scott, I remember emailing him and asking him like how, what glue he uses. And he oh. sent me his little recipe. <laughs> oh, no way. Um, Dude, I got to, um, I hate to interject. I had a friend and I, we just finished a job for Australian Open and Tennis Australia. And there was a paste up component. Yeah. Dude, talk about torture. We had to do this install between, <laughs> um, 8 PM and 8 AM. So I was like channeling, you know, those nighttime street vibes, but in uh, the National Tennis Center. So during the day, you've got Nadal and Rafa and Serena training. And then they're like, yeah, we'll let these hoodlums in at nighttime to do this little install. We pick up these, it was an uh, 11 by five meter wall that we had to do this thing on. We pick up the, the prints and they were fucked. 
Like you couldn't use them. You couldn't even know pictures of like tennis courts and rackets and things. Um, it's kind of stylized. It was so fucked. And I spent the whole day making this glue that I'd never made before. And I was just making yeah. it in the kitchen here. <laughs> and this rookie over here, me, I ended up making like 25 liters of the stuff. It took me like Whoa. five hours. Cause I had no idea. I had no scale of yeah. how much do you use? It's a lot of glue. Yeah. Better have more than, than not enough. We ended up doing this like massive pylon in there, wrapping it. And it worked out. It was all fine. But I reckon I used a liter. <laughs> so good Is that's it? like paint though you always yeah i always have way more paint than i think i need oh but, um, man anyway after all that Sorry. you make all that glue right and then yeah. i um you can just actually go to hardware stores and buy wallpaper glue. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah oh shit i should have emailed you um no, that out. took me a while to work out it's oh, pretty no. obvious when you think about when it you, but totally but um, anyway, so the whole point of my alias back then yeah. was I was really scared of like getting in trouble. So oh, I was like, course. I need an alias. And also there was a separation of um, I'm not accountable for this if people like it or don't like it because mm. it's, it's separate from my name. I can just put it out there and there's a freedom in that, which I really liked. Yeah. Um, but the reason I went with Creepy is my early drawings, my brother-in-law came over uh, one day and he, he just said, oh, that's really creepy. Huh. And uh, I really liked it because a lot of street names are like um, tough guy names. Yeah, yeah. And it's always been kind of silly to me, like yeah. self-appointed, like cool guy nickname. Yeah, yeah. So I just you wanted something it. like- Yeah, no you're one, not allowed to choose it. <laughs> yeah, but I also like, like no one wants to be creepy. Like, so I was like, yeah. oh yeah, that's not tough or it doesn't sound like um, I'm trying to be like, I yeah. don't know, it's just strange. And yeah. I was like, that's cool. Flex boy. Oh nine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess just from the reason it, it phased out was I started doing, uh, like fast forwarding a few years, but I started having exhibitions. I started working on more public art projects. Um, and I just didn't want to, I was a lot, I was more, um, ready to be accountable to a, attach the work to a name and be like and own it rather than feel the, mm. that freedom I was enjoying of being anonymous. Yeah. I, I was quite ready to um be like, okay, I'm I'm old enough now, I've had enough of a journey that if someone doesn't like it, it's not it's not gonna define yeah. my creative choices. It's just people like things and they don't like things. Yeah. Uh, and and by that stage there well, I remember there was a lot of positivity around the work as well. Yeah. Like it, you had you had and have an amazing rep and everybody, obviously it's your career. So people resonate with the work. And so was, was a part of, uh, you know, getting that thick skin of, you know, maybe people going over your work, ripping it down. You, you kind of just went off, oh, whatever, sweet. I'll um, make more. And I don't care if it's my name or, or creepy. Yeah. And that it's, never bothered me in terms of slowing me down, but yeah. I, I just, to do the name thing, I think it was around that 2008 when I, I just got really bored of it. I'd been mm. using it for like since 2004. Yeah. And um, it's kind of like, I'm not going to keep the same uh, Xbox name forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, and it's, it's totally a thing. And I yeah. guess getting a bit older, it just seemed, I don't know, it was kind of dumb to me yeah. to yeah. have like a secret name. Yeah. Um, so, and and it, it ran its course. Yeah. And I was definitely at an age where like, if I get in trouble for painting an abandoned spot or, um, I was just ready to be accountable for it. I was yeah. like, it's fine. I'm, yeah. um, I'm going to take it on the chin because I'm going to keep doing this. So, yeah. yeah. Amazing, man. So, um, obviously, from, from, from the times of, you know, just drawing and one, having the, uh, the desire to share it with the world, that led into more of the, I guess, a formal career path for a little while, right? Yeah. And was that, that obviously was co-excited. So during the day you were doing something completely different than, than the night. Yeah. So I studied industrial design yeah. and then I came and worked in Melbourne for a year mm. um, on um, retail design. So like yeah. shop fit out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what really, what sparked me doing the street work was mm. I was doing work for other people all day, but I was still compelled to draw and do all this stuff um, in my spare time. And it was just, uh, it, it just was the same time where I was like, it, it amplified the fact that I wanted to do that stuff yeah. more because yeah. I had not much spare time and most of my day was for someone else. Yeah. So it just really 
pushed me to kind of like, all right, here's all the commercial stuff. And then I'm going to go do the strangest fun stuff that I want to do. That's got no brief and no outcome and no, um, input and it's fine and really energizing. And I, I never had any plan to like, I never thought you could live being an artist. Yeah. I just was always drawing as a kid. Yeah. And, um, I just transferred into my adult life where I was like, I'm just doing it every time I have any spare time. I'm making stuff. Uh, it wasn't like a business plan. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I guess my <laughs> idea was like people that were full-time artists were like, it was just this romantic idea or you, you go yeah. to New York and you have to be like some crazy extrovert or something. You know, it's yeah. just like, that's never going to, it wasn't even an option. I was just like, I like making stuff. I'm not going to overthink it. I just keep making things. Yeah. And so for, for that part, for that time of, you know, working, I guess, corporate land, essentially, do you feel that you learnt a little bit of the business kind of nuance to, to navigate, I guess, maybe some of these bigger projects or, or working as an artist with a company? Because a, a lot of the conversations that I have, especially with, I guess a lot of younger designers and, and artists and, and even older as well, there's so many challenges when it comes to trying to get across a vision for a piece to somebody, you know, I hate to generalize or stereotype, but somebody in a suit who's just trying to balance the books. Yeah. Is, did you feel like you learned a, a lot through the, the more the industrial design stuff on that side, the business side of art? Um, I guess not. Not so much from the actual day to day because it was just like, this is your task, do the task. Okay. But definitely from studying. So when we would present um, our final projects or, um, you know, the, the chair or something that you'd designed, how you package that and mm. the concept kind of um, documents that you'd put together as the assignment. Yeah. Um, the storytelling. Yeah. And all the, the plans and the dimensions and the um, 3D working drawings. Mm-hmm. That stuff now, if you get a public art brief, it's the same. I'm getting those packages from um, arts organizations or interior designers or architects. Mm-hmm. And so just, I guess, having a, being familiar with that rhythm and that way of presenting things. And so language as well, right? Like yeah, yeah. some of the ways that um, sometimes it, I feel... I feel a lot of the times if, if I'm having a chat with somebody who's got one of those briefs and it might be the first or maybe even the 10th, sometimes there's a lot of translation in there going, hang on, I think they, okay, yeah, that still aligns. This is what they mean. They just said it really weird. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or I think what it also taught me was I, um, I understood you can have a great idea, but that idea you need to be able to um, – you need to be able to translate that in a very digestible way where people understand the scale, they understand the textures, they understand Hmm. the context of that final thing. Yeah. Uh, Anyone can send in a drawing or a painting on A4 paper, but if there's no context to how it sits within the broader vision of that specific project or the building or the wall, or it's very hard for the someone that's not in your brain to understand that information. They're like, Oh, it's a great picture, but yeah. Um, so from doing that course, it, that's how we had to present everything was like how you visualize it, but you don't let people visualize it. You just show it in place. Um, you show exactly how you want it to look, the colors, the light. Yeah. You give it context. Yeah. Yeah, You don't, you don't presume anything. Don't presume anything, but also in a very digestible, not overly complicated way. Yeah. There's a lot of, especially with painting, there's a lot of art speak. Yeah. That's important. And um, I, I believe that artwork can only get to a certain point if it's completely meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> you, I personally need to have things grounded on some concepts. Mm. But for public art, for me, it's about getting those ideas across. But imagining someone's on your website for one minute, which is pretty common on analytics. Yeah, totally. Do you understand it in one minute? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about it for 10 minutes. Let's talk about it for an hour. Okay. If I can get you to grasp it in one minute, then we can talk about it more. If you oh. don't understand it in one minute, then you're not going to understand it in an hour. Yeah. So, well, it's the same. Um, well, you might, but you know what I mean? Yeah, totally, totally. It's the same with businesses, right? When somebody tries to explain what they do and it takes them 10 minutes to explain, to me, it's a massive an alarm bell to go, maybe, maybe you actually don't know 
really what you're doing because the hardest thing is to explain something simply yep. and, and clearly and concisely and say, hey, this is what I do. We do. You know how, you know, there's a problem. This is what we do. It's the solution. Exactly. And especially if you're talking about um, visual language. Yeah. Um, and again, I most of those projects I'll have a one or two page, I guess it's an essay about the background of that work. Mm-hmm. But I I think work needs to be engaging on multiple la- layers. And if you can grasp it at least on one layer where you go, oh, I can see how big that that idea is in this space. I can see what materials you're thinking of using. Mm. Um, then we can then talk about the deeper layers of the onion, you know? Yeah. Is there a certain level as well? And I think, you know, as a, you know, I obviously work in the creative field as do you and, and I'm exposed to a whole bunch of different things, but I must admit, I'm a pretty fucking shallow viewer of art. I kind of look <laughs> at things to be completely fair. Like if you go to the NGV with me, it's a walkthrough. Like I very rarely yeah. stop. I'm like, yeah, I get it. That's awesome. That's so great. I don't need to stand there and look at it forever. Cause I, I get it. That's sick. You know, I'm not, you know, I might be um, extending the truth a little bit here, but just to paint the picture, <laughs> great, yeah. great pun. Um, <laughs> I like to just look at something and go, Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. And that, you know, inspired me or made me happy in a tiny little way. And that's great. And, let me continue with my day essentially. Yep. And then there's, so that might be the the surface level of the young because if you're putting a proposal in front of somebody, well, gee, it's got to look good. <laughs> yeah. And you most, know? most point, like most, in most cases, they've sent you the brief. So they understand mm. the core concepts of what they're wanting this thing to be based on. Yeah. So it's not, it's about for me getting that aesthetic and that initial reaction. People like pictures and yeah. that's why I'm paint or draw. Cause I'm mm. not, as strong with words, but so if I can get that, um, if it's visually engaging straight away, yeah, cool. Let's talk deeper. And, mm. uh, I mean that sincerely cause I don't think you can, I, I couldn't do that if the picture was completely meaningless and only aesthetically based. Yeah. I couldn't do that long term. I would, um, there wouldn't be enough for me to work from or to, to base concepts from. Yeah. So I, I need that background <laughs> that I've thought about and considered to get to that aesthetic. Yeah. But I, I definitely agree with you. I've always struggled with the fact that, um, why can't something have meaning, but also be aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Pleasing. And there's a, there's a lot of fine art that I'm, you know, I'll walk around a gallery. I actually quite enjoy being obnoxious in giant museums and being like, Oh yeah, that one's pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I'd look at that. Um, (laughs) But that's, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But then the things that I, I'm emotionally connected to. Yeah, I'll go buy the book and read totally the the all the documents based on this thing. And mm. even then, I don't know if I 100% agree with the text. Is why I'm engaged in that image anyway. But yeah. I so there's something in that. There's a fine line there where I think artwork works for me if the viewer can in, engage in it emotionally or aesthetically with their own experiences so at, at multiple levels yeah so if you're seeing something in it that i'm wasn't my intention but it's interesting to you mm. i don't see that as a problem i actually think that's when it's strong whereas if you instantly look at it and go oh it's a painting of the beach um that's not engaging like there's not you need mm. to have some level where it's personal to that person yeah and it might be coming from a place that's completely opposite to that, but that's, I don't, I think that's kind of great if, if yeah. it's open to interpretation. Yeah, totally. I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I think that often with, with pieces, and especially if we're talking about, you know, large, large scale murals that are in a public domain that aren't, you know, behind gallery doors or, you know, in these beautiful, but kind of fancy areas that you go intentionally to yep. be inspired or to look at something when it's in a, in the public domain and that's either a product or on a wall or a fit out, you know, it's the same thing. I often think that sometimes what we forget that a, a viewer might see that 10 times a day. Mm. So every time that they see it, they might see something new and, and just walking around here, like around Collingwood and Fitzroy and you cru- cruise around and you see walls and I must walk past the same wall. I have no idea how many times a day, but I often walk past and go, I never noticed that. Huh? Yeah. Huh. Cause, cause I'm interacting with a piece more than once. It's not, I'm in a gallery and I'm going to look at it right now and have to take 10 minutes to absorb it all. 
no, I maybe I'll walk past the gang and, and I'll get something new out of it every single time. That's the dream, I think. If, yeah. if a if an outcome is working like that, whether it's architecture or a painting or a sculpture mm. or music, if you can hear things differently um, with something that's very familiar to you in your routine, I think that's successful because you're it's continuously engaging you. Yeah. Rather than just being like, oh, cool, I've worked it out instantly and um, I don't feel challenged by it. It's not making me, f- there's no tension or there's no like, oh, I love those colors. Like it can work yeah. both ways. You can feel uncomfortable about something and that can be successful too. Hmm. As long as it's, for me, it's about trying to keep that engagement and um, yeah. Have, have someone there. No, we can't like talk about that without talking about mixed medium then, I guess. Yeah. Because naturally, you know, it, talking about seeing some paint on a wall and, and a traditional mural, which you've done heaps of, and there's so many, and, and I'll put some heaps of links in, in the show notes for this. Um, you know, everything from the silo project in Meriden, that thing was huge, you know, that, that piece. Yeah. It was um, pretty big, man. I mean, they're like 12 stories each. Yeah. How long did that take? It took two weeks wow. with, a uh, um, Jack Pam, um, is a curator. Mm-hmm. Um, based in Fremantle and he, he helped me paint that. Um, so we were, they basically, yeah, that was faster than we thought. We allowed a month. But, wow. Dude, double time. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I loved the problem solving of that. Like it could be curved. Just the, it took me back to when I first painted the, my first one story mural, like the yeah. one where you showed me yeah. from the first, uh, rediscover. Yeah. Um, I, you know, painting one story things, it was so huge and crazy and like, how do you scale it up? And, yeah. uh, I've painted a lot of things that are that two, three stories and I don't feel that same sense of, um, problem solving and creative challenge. Like, challenge. Yeah. I feel it in the actual final painting and the color choices and things, but not in the f- practical, like how, how, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did you- so the silos was a very good how exercise. It's a big yeah. grid, right? Is oh, I'm not uh, a grid guy. Not yeah, a grid guy. I never wow. never did those very well in primary school. Um man. <laughs> I just Col- color H3 blue. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. quite. It was a lot um more I just broke it down to I took a photo of it mm. and then I painted on the photo. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then I just looked, oh those eyes are in line with that um section of the fire escape that's 10 stories off the ground. Dude. <laughs> so that's great in theory until you start chalking up and then it takes you 10 minutes to get back off, the, down off the machine, cross the field. Oh, I can't see shit. the chalk line. Oh, yeah, of course. So that was, um, yeah, I just had to start painting it and and paint smaller and go out. But I, I measured everything off that. Yeah, you, um, you're not going big and going in. <laughs> that's a lot of buffing. But the maths were crazy. Like oh, from that goodness. concept, I uh, used a scale rule to measure everything. Yeah. Like the arms were 12 meters long. So when you're oh, up there yeah. and measuring those down, you're like, and you're blind to the rest of the painting. Yeah. Cause you're so close. Yeah. You're just like, this cannot be correct. And then you get on the ground and you're like, maybe another meter. <laughs> like, oh my God. So uh, I, yeah, I loved it. It was so good problem solving wise. Far out. Yeah. So are those problems and the so paint problems and moving into some of the, some of my favorite work of yours as well is, is the kind of 3D laser cut. Oh, More architecture work, yep. which um, I guess is a lot of computer stuff, I'm guessing. Well, I don't know about the process, but maybe we could talk about, does it start with a drawing and then seeing it from paper into something that's 3D and cut and now there's light and shadows involved in the interaction there? Yep. Is that process different? Oh, d- it's actually, uh, it's a little bit different. The process is very different, but the um, in terms of where it's coming from is a similar place. Yeah. So I'll do lots of pencil sketches and little thumbnail drawings. Yeah. But in terms of final production, yeah, there's a lot more um, back and forth with the manufacturer and um, getting samples made. And uh, I really love that process as well, though, when you, you can send a digital file or a vector or something and it turn it into a tangible mm. um, thing. And, and it's just been a natural extension. So it's like murals are great and I actually love them when they fade but making 3D things potentially has a little bit more longevity and Mm. and then I can start I've been really interested in shadow play in the last two years and I can start really playing with those kind of like the ephemeral aspects of when I first started putting posters up and snails eating them 
I get that with shadows changing and that 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 work will only look that way at two o'clock in the afternoon. And then at 9 a.m. it'll look different because the shadows are all shifting and changing. And that's that thing, hopefully, if you live in that place where the public art is, that person that walks past at different times of the day gets a different engagement with that same work. Um, and then there would be two two um, different, I guess, stories going on. It's, it's the by, bystander or the you know the pedestrian who's cruising past they will see a different different show at a different time of the day essentially but then also the people living and working within the building will be seeing different things as well yeah i just finished a, a work um last oh, 2017 that was 60 individual cut out panels that stick out the side of a building yeah and that shadow play is happening across the facade but the actual work goes across two people's balconies, like vertically. Yeah. So when we're installing them, those people, it's like they get a whole different shadow play like on their balconies every day because it's just moving and it's extending into their living space as well. Wow. Which was um really interesting to see because I'd, to be honest, I'd been thinking about the facade. Yeah. Not, I knew there would be some shadow play the other way around, but just seeing it like, yeah, um, kind of a lot of those shapes as well are sort of implying, um, I work a lot with uh, of ideas of like journey and um, path making and mapping. Yeah. Uh, so they're kind of like little nodes and things like that. So it was nice seeing those shapes get stretched and extend across their walls and up onto their ceilings. And man, um, some lucky residents. That's epic. Yeah. I, I, hopefully they like shadows. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking these shadows and getting sunburnt, all these nodes on me. Yeah, I just put our foil up on the window. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Goodness, man, that's that's insane. And so, man, it's been such a an epic, uh, I guess, story from paste ups all the way through to you know huge silos, all the way through to to three D and and laser cut and laser cutting or CNC. Or, or yeah, I've done um, a lot of laser cut work, some yeah. screens, yeah. perforated screens, um, and some mosaic glass tile mosaics as well. Yeah, oh, huge. Then you jumped into books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was sort of happening at the same, like, um, that started around 2010, I think. And yeah. so you've got five, six, five books. Yeah. Five, um, children's books. Yeah. Man. Well, one of them's a coloring in book. So it's like, <laughs> is it a book? <laughs> <laughs> um, We'll count it. We'll yeah. count it as a book. I'm not the judge on what, yeah. what makes a book or not. Maybe we have to Google what what makes this a book or not. Um, so yeah, ten tiny things, a, a thousand trees off the wall. Can a skeleton have an X-ray? And on a small island, um, what was the inspiration? Like, if, you know, is there one of those? What's your most favorite? I guess of all books, they all they all tell amazing different stories. But is there one that? stood out more for you during the process? Uh, I, it was interesting. Cause I, again, I, it, um, I'm not trying to sound flippant about these things, but it did actually, actually sort of happen accidentally and naturally, mm -hmm. um, the first book. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not, I definitely aren't someone that, uh, something drives me nuts when I hear people being like, Oh, I just did this thing. And then I just accidentally made this like thing that everyone liked it. I'm, I feel like I'm working a lot and I put a lot of time and energy into things constantly. And I, I've heard you speak about it with, I, I don't know if it was with Andrew or Gus, but that idea of um, you make your own luck kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so I've been busy with all these public art projects and doing exhibitions and the children's book opportunity basically was a emerged from um, a designer from Fremantle Press had seen my work in an exhibition mm. and Fremantle Press quite like, getting artists that are not maybe traditional illustrators that, you know, to, to work on children's books just because they bring it, a, come, come from a different angle. Yeah. And uh, so I was approached by them and um, I had been approached in the past about children's books, but uh, nothing had really resonated. And I'd always wanted to work on one because as a kid and being visual, they were like my, my favorite books were like these treasured objects, you know? Yeah. I remember the, the red tree. So Sean Tan, uh, yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, like, what a book. Yeah, I've got this one that's called the um, Absurd Australian Alphabet. Yeah, and it's kind of terrifying. Like it's it's just limericks with each alphabet letter. But um, D for Dinky Die. <laughs> but the drawings are just like there's like a guy that like walks on his nose, and there's like a, got a tiny shoe for his nose, and like it's just. Oh. 
so absurd. And then, uh, but anyway, so I was obsessed with all those kind of things. So getting the opportunity and then I was approached with 10 Tiny Things, which is written by Meg McKinley. Mm-hmm. And I really like the story. It's about getting out of the green machine and um, observing the world around you and just appreciating the, the things that are everywhere that because you're going so fast or you're so in your own head, you don't notice those little things. Mm-hmm. Um, so on a street art level or even like I used to ride BMX and know lots of skaters, you look at the city like that. You're not. Yeah. You, you're just right. you're looking at everything in a different way, or someone's put a poster up in a super dangerous place, or they've done a um, graffiti super high up, and it's really impressive because they've. Yeah. You can just see like a Prince of Persia. Crea- <laughs> yeah, they didn't die. There's a creative like computer game. You can map their path and be like, ah, that's they jump from that to that, and yeah. Uh, anyway, so that that those kind of ideas are represented in a different way in this book. Um, but process wise, I don't really have a favorite. I've tried to do different, um, mediums for each book. So 10 tiny things is painting on timber. Um, skeleton has an x-rays, watercolor, acrylic on linen for a uh, small island and mm. thousand trees is watercolor and pencil. Yeah, man. So acrylic on linen. Yeah. Well, I was oh. time consuming. I, <laughs> I bet, man. Yeah. They, um, you mentioned before we, we went on air that you, you've done a lot of work in, in textile design coming up. Did you bring it back to you those, to those days? Uh, oh, most of that work was um, done digitally. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was a little bit of a, a vibe with, uh, I guess, the pattern making and things like that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, want, I want to do that with kids' books. I deliberately made everything non-digital mm-hmm. so that when it gets photographed, those little lumps of paint or bleed out uh, – <laughs> that something happens in that process where it gets flattened back into a book and it's just looks really human. Yeah. Hey, um, just tiny segue, you know, Alan DeGeneres, like Alan, Alan, like Alan on TV. That's yeah. really famous. Yeah. That one. I've heard of and, it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Portia De Rossi. Have you seen Portia's business? No, she's got a business and I hope, I think this is right. I think it's called public artwork. I think it's called, but she, 3D scans original art, so all the lumps and bumps that they've mentioned, and then 3D prints them. So ah. you can buy essentially it's a uh, the step between an original piece of art and a print, but you're getting like a 3D print. So you get the the paint, the brush strokes, the drips, the drabs, all the little lumps oh, and crazy. bumps. It's insane. I think they do like a lower edition. Um, and obviously a lot more than a, than a print, the cost. So it's like in between an original and an office works print on canvas. Ex- exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I think the price is, is in between too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it just wow. reminded me, but how amazing that, that the influence of, of tech and, and traditionally tech and 3d printing, it's, you know, a lot of it gets caught up in, in the negative of, you know, 3d printed guns and, you know, all these other things and, you yeah. know, the influence on manufacturing industry and deindustrialization, I guess, of the world. Um, but I just, just wanted to share yeah, that's that cool. because it's insane. I, that it's- 3D printing is such an amazing concept to me. Like, um, but to be honest, I'm still pumped about like pay pass and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, anything yeah. like Wi-Fi is still pretty cool to me. <laughs> it is. It's, it is definitely. Um, yeah. It blows my mind every day that, you know, when we upload a podcast and somebody will go, Oh my God, man, that was so sick. I've been following, you know, so-and-so's work for a long time. I've never heard their voice. Um, but yeah, 3d printed art, keep, keep an eye yeah, out for them. Might be the next thing, man. So what's, What's on the agenda? What's next? Um, I, I think it's important to add that, um, you know, you got a little boy, Ari. Yeah. How, how old's he now? Uh, he is nearly 21 months. Yeah. All right. So I'm in the right. dad zone. Yeah. Dad zone, dad zone. Has that changed the way that you work? Um, Apart from the obvious like sleep and stuff like that, like is, is, has that impacted your work in ways that were unexpected potentially? What's interesting about it is that, uh, I'm psychologically in, in a better place. Like I feel like if I had a kid younger, I was, wouldn't have been, um, as comfortable mm-hmm. with the general concept of, um, uh, a new consciousness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty heavy trying not to think about it too much. Um, yeah. but I, I work, uh, quite a lot. Uh, I always say I work for myself obviously and have mm-hmm. been for the last, since 
2008 um, full time. And I feel like I work much harder and much more intensely than whenever I worked in another design studio. So having Ari has actually made me, um, I feel like I'm productive and efficient, but it's just made me like super efficient. So Mm -hmm. maybe in emails where it's a new contact or something and I'd have a little bit more small talk about Mm -hmm. like the long weekend or something, I just, that's gone. I'm just like, Hey, here's the dot points I need to know. What do you need to know? Yeah. Let's get down to business. Let's let's do it. And if we, it's more complicated than that, then it's just cool because it's way faster. Yeah. And we can make notes and go from there. So that side of it's been really good because I'm, my time is, uh, different with him. Like it's more stretched. So I just want to be more efficient with, um, yeah, I try not to go to meetings as much. Uh, I'll go to meetings when I have to, but I, High communication is incredibly important to me. And over the years, it's proven the projects that have I've learned lessons from are the ones that the communication levels are not good at the start and then they stay bad and then the project's confusing and strange. High communication, even if it's email and phone calls at the beginning, is it, you can still get the same thing and then you get to like step four and you're like, okay, now it's time to meet. Let's go. Yeah. So, and I'm not – it's important to meet people 100% because – it, there is a different dynamic that happens and it you obviously can be introduced to other people that you might end up working with or have a tangent or you could provide a contact to them in yeah, two years time or something. Out, yeah. That stuff's very important, but just, yeah, being time poor because I want to hang out with my kid mm. and painting is very time consuming. I'm just, yeah, just bullet point. Totally. Well, I think I've found, I found similar like if, on projects, if, if the communications kind of shit from the start, it's, um, and even sometimes if it's really good and the, as if you, you, you meet with a client, everything seems sweet. You're like, yeah, they totally get it. They just said, yeah, go do nuts, do, you know, go nuts, do whatever you want. Yeah. If the communication drops off, I feel like the wavelengths kind of separate mm-hmm. and I'll go off on a tangent because that's what I thought we were agreed to. Yeah. But because we haven't checked in every week or whatever, and it's even with colleagues, it's the same. Like, you know, you need to check check in all the time or your partner. It's the same thing with, with just humans in general to ensure that, you, I guess, the rhythm is the same For so sure. that the outcome is intended and and expected rather than the, what, hang on, no, I just made all these things because that's what you said. No, I didn't mean that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very easy to that to get cloudy. Yeah, misinterpret. Um, so I'm highly aware of that. That's one of my main things that I gauge projects off from the beginning mm-hmm. is um, have do I, yeah, how's the communication? Do I know this person? Yeah. Do I know anyone that knows this person? Can I look at their past projects? Yeah. Um, what, and, what's happened here? And usually if someone's a little bit vague and elusive, guess what? <laughs> 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 the project's vague and elusive. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I think in, in this kind of overly connected world as well, I think it's been heightened because you can connect with anybody at any time. Like, you know, we chat on Instagram more than anything else because it's, quick, effective, and it's like to the point, and that's on, I guess, a different level. But I think working in, in the corporate space and, and getting caught up in that bureaucracy, I'm always whinging about these, you know, emails about emails and meetings about meetings. It's like, guys, I'm pretty sure we can cut this crap out and like just send one concise message and it will be done and let's have one meeting instead of four yep. because there's nothing more frustrating, especially on the creative side when creating does take time. Like all designers, artists, um, you know, anyone in the creative creative field, um, I think can can all agree that the number one thing that pisses you off with a client is when they say, "Yeah, no stress." Um, you know, they'll just it'll only be like an hour's work, and you're like, "Man, it's, nothing is an hour's work. It's an yep. hour's work plus twenty years of experience plus yeah, hundred you percent know, waking up at two o'clock and and going, "Oh shit, what if it was like this?" And, and nothing's an hour, so that hour that you just stole for that meeting or those 20 emails, I could put into the, into the work and the work would be better. So let's figure this process out first. So the outcome is, is heightened. Yeah. And I think a hundred percent agree with that. I also think the projects and people I've worked with that understand that you get the strongest outcomes because they're, they're um, respecting that time heavy thing. Even if the final outcome is like quite a simple, uh, just say it was a logo and it's very mm. simple. Yeah. 
maybe you got that on your third sketch, but you yeah. still had to go on this giant journey to get back to that third sketch. Yeah. And if you did get that on your third sketch, then, man, it's kind of really impressive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not, totally. It's not a negative. It's no. like good for you. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I think the people that any of the projects I've been really proud to work with those people and proud of the final outcome, there is this trust there where it's like, okay, we understand mm. um, that process. And not to disrespect anyone, I feel like when I was working for studios, I might finish all my tasks for the day by three o'clock, but I just have to sit there till five. Yeah. So I might book a little meeting in there because uh fills out my Arvo. You know? Yeah, it gets, yeah, <laughs> Whereas, yeah. Work, if I go home, I'm not getting paid. If yeah. I work for myself and I finish my tasks by three o'clock, which never happens, but if yeah. I did, that's yeah. up to me to find the next task or I can go to the beach and do whatever I want, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, I'm not just filling my day because I'm on a wage and I'm getting paid anyway. So yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, um, the future of work is always hot topic around the coffee table with, with the, with the Rochambeau crew. And I guess we're lucky enough that we, we always say that we're from the future and basically it's, <laughs> I think you guys are from the future, <laughs> but I think everybody who freelances and works for themselves is from the future. And the tricky part is, is when you're from the future and you're working with people that are in, stuck in the past and they need to fill in those few hours. And I mean, for us, there's days where we'll, we'll wake up, we'll touch base with each other. Hey, what's going on? What are you, what are you working on? Yeah. I just got to get this done by Friday. Sweet. And this might be Wednesday. And there's been so many times where I'll pick up the pen or I'll start trying to, you know, smash something out and it's just not working. And so for me in the process, I don't, I don't force it. I put it down and I'll go to the beach or I'll go catch up with somebody because creativity is not something that you can just turn on and go be creative now. Like it's, yeah. it's a constant grind to get in the zone and make sure that that product's right. And that doesn't fit into the nine to five life, like rock up, have a coffee, talk some shit by the water cooler. Now create. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually don't, uh, I, I completely agree with you because you might go and do that other thing, but then you'll be back at it when the spark comes and you mm. might work till 2am. So yeah, yeah, you're doing the same process, but I, I don't really, I'm also quite naive to the nine to five as well. I'm, I'm sure mm. there's um, models out there where there is much more flexibility with I'm sure. um, that kind of thinking, but I definitely agree with you. I think that's the way forward for um, work life mm. is as long as people are um, getting to the outcome within the required constraints. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to go and get a clear head and then that sparks the thing and you work till 2 a.m., you might not want to do that because you've got a newborn. Yeah. Or that's when it happens. You're still getting there. It's totally. just a different I way. I think yeah. it's... um. I think it's almost a spectrum where on one side of the spectrum, it is nine to five. It has to be done at this time and nothing is expected to be done outside of those times, which is, which doesn't really happen because we're too connected now and our phones are going off at nine o'clock at night. And, if, and this doesn't matter if you're yeah. in admin or you're in, you know, creatives or what, it doesn't really matter. Work's not going to fit into nine to five for majority of the workforce. If that's one side of the spectrum and the other side is, completely, completely, um, I guess spread out globally and you've got people working wherever they need to work on a project. Everybody needs, knows the, the due dates. And there's so many programs you, you, we use Dropbox pretty much for everything in Dropbox paper mm -hmm. to manage a process within our own teams and then communicate with a client. I think that's on an, another side of the fence and it doesn't matter if somebody's on a plane or, you know, at their house or together in a studio. Yeah, it works that way, and I think there's you're right. There's a spectrum of it where people there's there are organisations in the middle which have a f one foot in in the traditional sense because their clients live in in the traditional land of nine to five, so they have to be as well because they, they have to be access accessible. Yeah, <laughs> they have that for a stumble, and then um, on the other side of the fence is yeah, cool. If you want to create from home, do that, what whatever. And I think time will will probably shift us into one direction because. I think finding meaning and, and a work-life balance is more important to the younger generations because we do have the flexibility and the options rather than, you know, maybe our parents who that wasn't an option to, hey, I feel like working from the couch today. Like, shut up, man, go to work. Yeah. Like it yep. wasn't a thing. And I think that, yeah, it, I think you're right. It'll just naturally merge into that hopefully. Mm. But um, I also like that system 
of how I've been working. Cause if I'm installing a mural, I don't reply to emails. I don't pay attention to anything. I just, I'm like, I've got this six, seven days to do this task mm-hmm. and then I'll play catch up. Yeah. And that's, you know, you're not, you're not being like, Hey, you have to have to be um, on demand for someone. You like, I can't do it. My head's focused on this one thing yeah. right now. And it's not fair on, on the client that you're working on with that install. Yeah. Because you've promised them, you know, this quality of work and that there needs to be some sort of like mute button on, on the rest of the work. And it's not from a, a rude place of, I don't want to hear from you. It's like, hang on, I need to do this because this is what I do. And this yeah. needs to be really. I am jealous though of the nine to five. Like they get, <laughs> they get Friday drinks. And, they are, oh, man. I've Christmas been, parties. Christmas parties. Super. <laughs> super, super, yeah. Yeah, I, I often, you know, when people are talking about super, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't paid super my whole career. Yeah, and now, now I'm in the dad zone. I'm like, I'm paying super now. It's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's my Christmas party? <laughs> yeah, fuck, I need that stuff. <laughs> hey, um, in uh, Odd Chaos, the, the video uh, short film that we mentioned before, I, I just remember you you said something really profound, which, and I'm going to misquote you here, but it was something to the effect of, I want to remind the 15-year-old me of um, – if I could tell the 15 year old me, the project that I'm working on now, how much energy and excitement would, would they, would I take into that project, which I found like really amazing outlook and, and quote, um, do you often return to, to that sort of thinking? Yeah, I definitely with that in the video, I also wish I'd, cause I'm very, um, sorry, I, I keep saying I'm a lot, but I don't, I don't uh, talk on microphones very often. It's, it's all good, man. So you just have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> so uh, in that quote, I 100% approach things like that, but there's a slight tagline to that where I'm also extremely deliberate about the things that I mm. want to work on mm-hmm. now because of past experiences. And um, fortunately, I'm in a position where I can do that at the moment. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, the things I say yes to, I really want to work on. And there's things that I say no to for different reasons that people never know that you were even approached for because it's, you said no and it's not public. Yeah. But the things I say yes to, I genuinely, and I, I, it's bigger than like my own decision. Like I naturally feel that energy still because I love, yeah, I love drawing, I love painting, I love coming up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. And if I've decided to lock into it, yeah, I do th- think about that a lot. Like I've got this funny memory where I used to come home from school uh, and draw on like we'd just print a paper with an art line pen. Yeah. And I had a little Discman. Um, so a Discman is like uh, this uh, <laughs> yeah. this thing that we uh, played a Ari. silver disc. <laughs> when Ari's listening to this in the future. <laughs> yeah, and I have these tiny um, head uh, speakers that would plug into this flat. Th- you couldn't move the object because the music would stop. <laughs> it would skip, remember? <laughs> you'd try to put it in your pocket and you'd tiptoe around the house. Oh, man. You could not exercise with a Discman. <laughs> really long headphone cables. Um, yeah. Anyway, but I would just listen to the... Uh, that Oasis album oh. with Wonderwall, whatever that yeah, album yeah. was, because that's when it came out. That was my first CD. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I would just vibe on that and just be like, get into that weird meditative state where you're kind of like, it's kind of like I, I imagine with running, mm. once you stop thinking about the physical, you're just in this um, zone. Yeah. And uh, it's that zone that I feel really happy and it's the zone I'm chasing. Yeah. Um, Flow state. Less Oasis now, but. Yeah. So that, whatever that feeling is. Yeah, I, I naturally have that towards things I want to work on. Mm. But I don't, if I'm not feeling that, then it's like a natural sign to be like, maybe this isn't the right fit. So it's just important. I want to be excited about the things I work on. Like life's really short. If I'm not excited about it, like I've always thought time's way more valuable than material things or for sure financial gain. If you can balance that, then that's great. Mm-hmm. But I would much rather just, be engaged with the thing I'm working on a hundred percent, even if it's, um, yeah, just for that, that feeling of like, uh, it it might be naive and a bit pure thinking, but that's just how I see it. I just want to be excited about what I'm working on. Man, I fully, I fully agree with you there. I think it reminds me of, um, I listened to, uh, Lucy and Joe from hunting for, uh, hunting for George, which is, you know, the stores, the uh, homeware stores, uh, yeah, yeah. online store, We've got some physical stores as well, which is so sick. Yep. And, I, and they were speaking at a, an event called online, uh, online offline. 
which is like an e-commerce thing. And um, they said, you need to say yes until you can say no. And they shared a similar story that at the start, I think everybody who's trying to you know carve their own way, because we're, we need to pay our bills, there's that balance of the work I really want to do because it's amazing and work for that brand or mm-hmm. that project. But then there was, there's also the the reality of I need to eat and pay my bills. Yeah. And so you got to say yes to build the reputation until you get to a point where you can, you can become pure and, and try to choose and, and say, hang on, I don't actually have to do that thing. Yeah. But I feel that you, you actually don't know and you don't gain the, the insights on, onto the projects that have the alarm bells until you do the ones that go wrong. Oh, of course. If that makes sense. So you have to do those ones that kind of fuck up or they'll blow up in your face so you can learn, oh shit, nah, the communication was shit. That's never been good in my, my personal experience. Mm-hmm. Now I can say no to that sort of thing to, to ensure that I can create because otherwise I think you fall out of love with creating. And if, and for me, if I'm working on a project where it's going horribly, I just, the, the work's not as good because I'm not as connected with it. And it's not because of the creative process for me. It's because that accounts person pissed me off mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or you know, whatever it is. It's yeah. a, it's I think that's a really good point to make because I'm, what I'm talking about is something that's developed over 15 years. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying, I actually think is not, if you come straight out of art school or uni or whatever, and you say no to everything, that's not what I'm saying. I think that would be, you, you're making terrible choices. <laughs> yeah. Say yes, get experience. Yeah. yeah. Say yes, learn and work, work out what your parameters are that you're actually comfortable in mm. and, if you can channel it um, in the direction you want to, yeah. then that's great. It's a little different with visual art because it's so personal. Yeah. If I'm working with a commercial brand, I uh, I don't want to be dictated to. Yeah. So because I've, I've worked in design studios, I'm happy to work on a brief. Yeah. But if it's my personal work, it's a totally different thing. Like I, I don't want to be told what to do. Uh, I can work within parameters and variables but if you start telling me to change colors and you need to include like a specific literal thing i'm just not interested totally and and i have to be like that because it's uh my artwork's so personal to me Mm. and i don't i'm gonna do it whether i'm getting paid for it or not so getting paid for it's a great byproduct yeah but i'm very staunch on that i do don't want um it's not an open brief yeah. But it's not, I've only got to that point over time from seeing what I do and do not like. But at the same time, if I was working on design projects yeah, and they say, hey, it needs to do this, we need this text included, blah, blah, blah. It's a different thing. Yeah, and you can choose to be excited about that and you can choose to that, – that brief is a different beast. Yeah. But for visual art and public art and exhibitions, if someone's trying to corner me into something, this sounds like dramatic, but it, it's literally all I've got. Like it – it's defined my whole life. Yeah. So I want to make what I want to make. Totally. And we can work together and that would be great, yeah. but it's not my it's not my drive for why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to work with your brand. I'm doing this because I'm doing it. Like yeah. I can't not do it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people struggle that. I know I've personally had a similar struggle with disconnecting. Um, I, I think something that I'd want to do under my own name and going, this represents me like you, you and, and, and the art and then trying to merge that with a design brief, put this, you know, it has to have the weight on the front or the, you know, if you're, I'm doing, you know, I've done like beer cans and that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. But I, I've had to mentally disconnect and go, hang on, hang on, hang on. This isn't a Jordan thing. It's this just is, a gig. Yeah. This is just a gig. And, and it's and, a cool gig, but it's a gig. And yeah. I need to do that to enable me to do this other thing. And this other thing is going to take a long time to then transfer into that's all I do. And when you get that, it's, you know, it doesn't happen in a year or hopefully for anyone listening, if you can make it happen in a year, epic, good on you. Yeah. That's That's so sick. That's that's the skill. (laughs) Yeah. That's the man. So dude, I think this is a perfect thing to, I guess, maybe, maybe end on. If you were to talk to maybe, I, I don't know, yourself at 15 years old or probably more, people listening that might be just leaving uni or art school, that sort of thing, looking at, at yourself going, fuck, that's what I want to aim for. Is there any piece of advice that you would, you, I know it's really hard to narrow it down to a single thing, but would there be something that you wish somebody told you when you were starting out? I think, uh, 
Well, I, I had really, my parents are super supportive mm. and um, they've always been like instilled really strong in work ethic. And I, I feel like they kind of did tell me that stuff when I was starting out, which I feel lucky for. Mm-hmm. But their attitude was you just don't expect anything from the world. Mm-hmm. Doesn't <laughs> owe you shit, hey? Doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. Uh, work really hard and just be nice. Like don't not don't get stu- stepped on by people. Yeah. That's a different thing. Yeah. But just be polite. Show up when you say you're going to be there. Work really hard. Be accountable. They're pretty basic principles. Yeah. Just don't be lazy and super self obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> the world doesn't owe you anything. <laughs> oh man, that I think that is the best advice uh, you could possibly get. I hundred percent agree. Dad, with that. dad advice. Dad right advice there. coming down strong. <laughs> man, I love it. Dude, thanks so much for rolling in. That's been, yeah, it's been so sick catching up. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. For people listening, you've mentioned you got some things coming up. Um, when Where can people find you? Uh, you can go to my Instagram, which yeah. is uh, if you have all the letters of the alphabet on your keyboard. <laughs> my name's Kyle Hughes Hodges. I'll, I'll chuck a link up. <laughs> I'll chuck. Uh, yeah, and I've got um, a show coming up in Perth in July at Turner Galleries. I see. And then I'm over going over to Iceland for a residency for a couple wow. months. Wow. So that'll be nice. Man. Paint some giant buildings and- Huge. Um, yeah. Jump on, give a follow, go to the show. Um, if you got kids or if you don't have kids, find buy the books. Where can we buy the books? If you go, the best place is if you go online. Yeah. Uh, if you just Google, if I don't know if you can put those links up, but if yeah, you yeah. Google um, my name or go to my website, it's on all the like normal cool. online store things. Yeah. So, yeah. Where all good books are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the computer. You'll You're work it computer. out. You'll figure it out. Man, thanks so much. This has been this has been sick. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And what a rad episode that was. If you enjoyed that and you want to hear more from Create and Destroy, help us out. Go to iTunes, give it a five star, subscribe to it, or tell your friends even better. Send them a link and that would definitely help us out to get more and more people in the show and create even more content. Hope you're having a rad day. Thanks.